Welcome everyone. This lecture is on bioethics and different moral theories. As we were saying in the last lecture, uh, moral theories are complex and inescapable. So we're regularly engaging with morality anyway already. Um, when we're thinking about like something like the moral worth um, or forms of moral responsibility for some action, um, we regularly engage in whether uh, certain ethical claims are legitimate or illegitimate. Uh, we also let uh, norms and moral principles uh, influence and guide our lives. So in this lecture, we're going to explore some of the theories that help frame our moral judgments, decisions, and actions. Specifically, we're going to explore how these uh, ethical theories are going to produce principles that uh, we're going to be applying in our bioethical uh, class. So uh, before we get into the moral theories, uh, what are moral theories more generally? Um, well, so like all theories, a theory is determined how good it is based on um, its explanatory power. So for example, the uh, heliocentric theory, the, the theory that you know the solar system revolves around the sun rather than like the um, one where the, everything revolves around the earth, um, you know, that uh, explanation of the solar system is a better theory because it offers a better explanation of planetary motions and everything like that. So moral theory should explain why action is uh, a right or wrong or why a person is good or bad. Uh, for example, according to, to divine command theory, morale, uh, moral actions are those ones that are commanded by um, or willed by God. Uh, but then we also have like other ones, so we'll get into these ones like utilitarianism. Um, a right action uh, are those that produce the greatest happiness for all of those concerned. So we often use uh, moral theories, um, but we're just not really aware of it, or at least like the principles that come from the moral theories. Um, when we're, uh, you know, thinking about certain things, uh, we're doing moral theorizing. For, for instance, um, when we're trying to understand the moral properties uh, of rightness or wrongness, like what does it mean to be right? What does it mean to be good? Um, or when we're trying to justify some moral principle or other norm. Um, or when we're trying to resolve a conflict between two credible principles, like these are all instances of when we're doing moral theorizing. Um, also, you know, when we're trying to explain why a particular action or a particular uh, instance it was like right or wrong. Um, this is also, uh, you know, when we're trying to evaluate uh, the plausibility of a specific moral institution or um, just thinking about like questioning uh, moral assumptions, things like that. Um, these are all instances when we're going to be engaging with certain moral theories. Um, so it's through reflection and theorizing on these larger patterns that we're actually able to make moral progress. This is, you know, how we think we're, you know, becoming better people or um, doing more moral things, uh, whether as a society or as individuals. So philosophers uh, tend to divide uh, moral theories up into two types. We have theories based on right action. Uh, these are moral theories about what is right or wrong, uh, which actions are right or wrong. Um, but then we also have virtue-based theories, and these theories are going to tell us more about, uh, you know, good or bad uh, people, what it is to be a good or bad person, or have a good or bad character. Okay, so to see how moral reasoning plays a role in our everyday lives, um, let's start with, uh, you know, theories of right actions. So these theories can figure directly into our reasoning. For example, um, let's consider this argument. Um, stem cell research should be fully funded rather than halted altogether because such a step would eventually lead to a uh, greater benefit for more people. And right action according to utilitarianism are those that result in the greatest overall benefit for the greatest number. So this is an argument and uh, philosophy likes to formalize them. Um, and we can talk about this in your uh, classes and sections about how to actually formalize this and, uh, you know, present your own arguments. Uh, but here's one way of formalizing this argument here. Premise one, fully funded stem cell research rather than halting it altogether would eventually lead to a greater benefit for more people. Premise two, right actions are those that result in the greatest 
overall benefit for the greatest number of people. Um, this comes from the principle of utilitarianism. And then we have our conclusion here. Stem cell research should be fully funded rather than halted altogether. So just giving us a little bit more background in these theories is going to give us a deeper understanding of the moral principles that we're going to be applying in this class. Um, so to be clear, these moral theories are just a part of the moral landscape. Um, they are the abstract explanations that coherently tie together the moral principles, rules, and judgments that uh, we just tend to use throughout our lives. So when applying these theories to real world cases, it's important uh, that we take uh, the details into account. So when we are uh, theorizing, um, our moral deliberations in, should involve both uh, you know, these theories, these big abstract principles, uh, but we should also remember to keep the details of the um, cases in, in, um, into account. So to see this, uh, suppose that you, you know, believe in moral theory, um, likely one that uh, you think gives a plausible explanation of what is right and what is wrong. Uh, and at some point you're going to be faced with a moral decision. So when we're faced with that, we tend to uh, look at our moral theories for guidance. Um, so from our theories, we tend to glean moral principles uh, that seem to apply to the cases at hand. Um, if these principles um, lead to conflicting choices, and then we look again to the theory to resolve it. Okay, so our moral theorizing, uh, that's how it kind of uses uh, theories to take into account, but it also must take into account our uh, judgments of particular cases. Um, if our judgments about a particular case are consistent with what our theory tells us, um, then it reassures us that our decisions were correct in that case. You know, makes sense. Uh, but if our judgments clash with our theories, uh, then we must decide whether we want to uh, revisit it or uh, discard it. So this is really just because of like a general principle of like reason. Um, you know, we should have, uh, you know, beliefs that are coherent with each other, you know, uh, ones that aren't contradicting, because um, it's generally bad to have contradictory beliefs. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, if upon reflection, uh, we find that our judgments of the case are more credible than the implications of our theories or principles, um, then we tend to modify our theory to accommodate these discrepancies. Um, and in some rare cases, they might actually discard the theory altogether, uh, but probably unlikely. So in contrast, the theory seems to be more credible. Um, in this case, we tend to conclude that our judgments are untrustworthy, um, and we usually discard them. So both our moral theories and our immediate uh, reactions to specific situations can be useful in our moral theorizing here. Um, our theories can offer us a framework in which to think through ethical situations, um, and our immediate reactions, uh, which can be fallible, can indicate our moral common sense um, and can be used as a check against, you know, a bad moral principle or a flawed theory. So if in uh, this class the theoretical or the specifics are going to be uh, useful, um, a lot of the specifics um, are, you know, going to come from you guys. So the theories are going to come from, you know, the next couple sections, but then the specifics are going to come from you guys. They're going to be your emotional reactions. They're going to be uh, your personal experiences, things like that. So uh, over the next couple of sections, uh, I'm going to just go over the next couple of, uh, you know, more influential moral theories um, for you guys to use that you probably already have been using as a moral framework to think through ethical situations, but hopefully give you a few more to help you think through them. All right. Bioethics is a field of applied ethics. In this field, they tend to apply the theories of right action the most. So there are two main theories of right action. First, there are consequentialist theories, and then there are deontological theories. So, consequentialist theories maintain that the rightness of an action depends solely on the consequences or the results. So, they maintain that how much a, uh, an action is good depends on how much good it produces. Um, and so, it kind of depends there on how good is defined. Um, so, in contrast, deontological theories, or generally non-consequentialist theories, um, say that the rightness of an action is determined not solely by the consequences, but partly or entirely by something about the nature of the action itself. So according to non-consequentialist theories, the rightness of some or all of the actions uh, depends on uh, the kind of action uh, that they are. 
and not how much like outcome uh, you know goodness they produce. So, for example, according to a consequentialist uh, theory, they're going to say that stealing is wrong uh, because it's going to cause more harm than good. In contrast, according to deontological theory, it says we shouldn't steal um, because it's inherently wrong to steal regardless of the consequences. Okay, so in the next few sections, I'm going to go over some of the next uh, major, more influential theories. Um, that's going to be in uh, utilitarianism, uh, Kantian ethics, uh, principalism, uh, natural law theory, uh, Rawls's contract theory, virtue ethics, the ethics of care, um, feminist ethics, and then we're going to look at an approach to ethics called casuistry. So the leading consequentialist view is going to be known as utilitarianism. According to this view, an action is right in proportion to how much good it produces. Um, in order to, you know, the good versus bad outcomes, you know, if it has more good outcomes than bad outcomes, then it's a good action. Um, so the utilitarian principle is going to dictate that we should maximize utility of everyone affected. And this principle should be followed regardless of other moral urgings, uh, you know, about rules or other principles. Uh, we should just follow the principle of utility according to utilitarianism. So there are various forms of utilitarianism. Uh, the main uh, way they're going to differ is basically how they're going to be like defining utility. So some are going to equate utility with happiness or pleasure. These are going to be known as like hedonistic approaches to utilitarianism. So others, uh, for others, utility is going to be equated to satisfaction of preferences or desires or some other intrinsically valuable good or state such as knowledge or perfection. Okay, so there are two main approaches uh, to applying the utilitarian model. So either you can apply it to specific actions or you can apply the utilitarian model to rules uh, that govern such actions. So the first is known as act utilitarianism. The idea is that the rightness or action or the rightness or wrongness of an action is going to depend solely on the relative goodness of that individual action. Um, so compared to the alternative choices, uh, you should choose the course of action that maximizes the utility of all involved for that specific choice and that specific action. Now, in contrast, there is rule utilitarianism um, that does not judge rightness or wrongness of specific actions, but instead focuses on the rules that govern our actions. So the idea is that a right action is one that conforms with a rule that, if followed consistently, would create um, you know, more overall benefit for everyone involved. Um, so uh, even though in like particular situations there might be, you know, it, there's going to be harm or suffering or things like that, when we follow the rule consistently, um, overall it's going to produce more happiness. Um, and so according to rule utilitarianism, because uh, following that rule consistently is going to produce that overall happiness, we should just follow that rule, even though situations might arise where following the rule might, you know, cause some pain or suffering. Okay, so uh, this first was proposed by English philosopher Jeremy Bentham. Um, he lived in 1784 to 1832. Um, he was the first to formally propose the classical version of utilitarianism um, that we kind of, you know, have the basis of today. Uh, but then it was actually later revised and given a lot more plausibility by another English philosopher, uh, John Stuart Mill. So the classic version of utilitarianism uh, comes from this like hedonistic approach um, where utility maximizing is about pleasure or broadly understood as like happiness. So according to this theory, uh, a right action produces more net happiness. Um, and so yeah, according to this John Stuart Mill quote here, we have um, actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness and wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. By happiness is intended pleasure in the absence of pain, and by unhappiness, pain and the privation of pleasure. So both uh, Bentham and Mill uh, discarded, uh, disagreed about exactly, you know, how to understand happiness here. Um, and many people still even disagree about it today. So Bentham used to think of happiness as one-dimensional. Um, you know, just pleasure. So according to this approach, uh, moral things, uh, uh, the moral thing is to do, uh, you know, what ex it gives you more like experience and, and uh, actual physical pleasure. Um, in contrast, Mill thinks that pleasure was a little bit more two-dimensional. Um, so he thought we had higher pleasures and lower pleasures. 
Um, so the lower pleasures are going to be derived from more like sensual experiences. So that's going to be like food, drug, sex. But then we also have like higher pleasures um, that are going to derive um, that are derived from you know pursuing knowledge or the appreciation of things like art and culture. So uh, one of the famous mill quotes uh, here is: "It is better to be a human dissatisfied than a pig satisfied." Uh, better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. So all forms of utilitarianism are going to demand a strong sense of impartiality. So this means that when you are doing your calculations for the net happiness of everyone involved, um, everyone uh, should, you know, you're not only just counting everyone involved, but you're also giving everyone's perspective equal weight. As Mill says, the happiness which forms the utilitarian standard of what is right conduct is not the agent's own happiness, but that of all concerned. As between his own happiness and that of others, utilitarianism requires him to be as strictly impartial as a disinterested and benevolent spectator. In classical utilitarianism, the emphasis is going to be on maximizing the total quantity of happiness um, that's for everyone involved without any restrictions on how that happiness is actually rationed out to the people. So for instance, consider these two actions. Action A, uh, you know, we have 10 people getting a thousand units of happiness total between the 10 people. Whereas in action B, we have 10 people who get 900 units of happiness. Um, now, according to classical utilitarianism, action A is always better than action B regardless of how the happiness is divided. Now, in action A, you know, yeah, there's 10,000 units divided between 10 people, but maybe that means that uh, one person is getting all 10,000 or all 1,000 units um, and the other nine people are getting nothing. Whereas in action B, uh, it's, uh, you know, 10 people getting 90 units. Um, so again, classical utilitarianism is going to say, well, action A is better because um, for everyone involved, um, there is more net happiness. That's how net happiness is supposed to work. Okay, so making sense of, uh, you know, most uh, uh, happiness, uh, the most amount of people being happy um, is not actually the most important. What's uh, important is uh, the total happiness overall. So uh, maximizing total happiness is more fundamental than maximizing the amount or the total people that are happy as well. Okay, so now with this uh, broad concept of uh, utilitarianism down, let's apply it to a bioethical case and see how utilitarianism is going to apply to this case. Johnny is a 10-year-old boy with cerebral palsy, emaciated and bedridden, hooked up to feeding tubes and monitors. His body twisted in pain that is almost impossible to control. His days measured out by one agonizing surgical operation after another locked in the mental life of an infant and acknowledged by all the experts to be without hope. His anguished parents wanted desperately to end his suffering, begged the physician to give Johnny a lethal injection. What should the physician do? So suppose in this case that there are just two options, um, indefinitely maintaining Johnny's present condition or carrying out the parents' wishes. So act utilitarianism, we'll consider that one first, uh, was going to reason as follows. Uh, according to the current situation, um, there is uh, a lot of you know, unhappiness going on. So there is Johnny's uh, own physical agony, um, the unimaginable misery and distraught of his parents, the anxiety of family members and friends, um, and the distress and frustration of the physicians and nurses um, who can do little more than just stand by and watch Johnny wither away. So on the other hand, administering lethal injection would immediately end Johnny's pain and prevent suffering. Uh, the parents would grieve for Johnny, but they would probably find relief um, and maybe even comfort in knowing that his uh, pain and suffering was over. So the medical staff are probably going to react similarly. Um, still, there are possible negative outcomes uh, for this action. Um, for instance, the physician could be professionally censured or potentially criminally prosecuted. Um, if the story was leaked and misunderstood by the media, it could understand, uh, undermine the uh, public trust in the medical profession as a whole. Um, also, this misconception could lead to uh, a general devaluing of 
the lives of disabled people. So, however, uh, if the physician were to act discreetly, they could alleviate the suffering without any of these possible outcomes. Um, when all of these factors are weighed up together, it seems that active utilitarianism is going to say that uh, the greater net happiness would uh, to be to perform the mercy killing, uh, which would therefore be uh, you know, the permissible course of action. So now, in contrast, let's look at how rule utilitarianism is going to approach the same situation with Johnny. Um, it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, so the key to this approach is which rule, if followed consistently, would produce the greatest net happiness. Okay, so uh, let's consider these two possible rules. Rule one, do not kill seriously impaired children, regardless of their suffering or the wishes of their parents. Rule two, killing seriously impaired children is permissible if they're suffering severely and improvement is hopeless. So between these two rules, a rule utilitarian might say that uh, consistently following the second rule uh, might lead to suspicion of physicians' actions and motives when they're treating um, uh, seriously impaired or disabled children, which could again in turn lead to general distrust of the medical community, which would in turn uh, cause a problem for the healthcare system as a whole. So society generally devaluing the lives of disabled people, which could uh, lead to the devaluing of lives of elderly or members of other uh, vulnerable populations. So further, following the second rule might uh, cause, uh, you know, us to have a blatant disregard for the principle of uh, medicine, the main principle of medicine, do no harm. Um, so in contrast, uh, consistently following the first rule would uh, not have those same consequences. Following the first rule would mean that impaired children uh, suffer, but uh, it is not as bad as the consequences of consistently following the second rule. So for that reason, a rule of utilitarianism would contend that uh, offering lethal injection uh, should not be permissible um, in spite of the parents' pleas for, uh, you know, to end Johnny's suffering there. Immanuel Kant was a German philosopher who lived from 1724 to 1804. Um, and he's generally widely regarded as one of the most influential modern philosophers. So Kant's ethical theory is known as a deontological theory, which actually comes from the Greek words for duty and science, so deon and logos, so deontology. Um, this view is generally uh, seen as the antithesis of utilitarianism, uh, because according to deontological theories, right actions do not depend on the outcomes. For Kant, the core of being a good person is following the set of rules that are uh, rational and applicable to everyone involved. Furthermore, um, Kant thought that for you to do the right action, you have to do it out of, um, you know, a motivation to follow duty alone. According to Kant, uh, according to Kantian ethics, an action is right only if it conforms to such a rule. And we are morally praiseworthy only if we perform it for duty's sake alone. Um, so right action is something that conforms to a rule, and we're only actually praiseworthy for doing that and following the rule um, if we're following the rule out of a sense of duty, not out of a sense of uh, self-interestness or anything like that. Um, so what are these moral duties? Well, uh, Kant thought that all of our duties can be expressed in um, the form of categorical imperatives. Um, so let's break that down. Um, first, an imperative is just a kind of a statement. It is a command. For example, uh, an imperative statement would be like, do your homework or eat your vegetables. Um, now, commands or uh, rules for category um, uh, are going to apply to everything in that category without exceptions. So categorical imperatives are uh, rules that apply to everything in the category. Everything it must, it must apply to everything in the category without exception. Now, in contrast to categorical imperatives, there are hypothetical uh, imperatives. Um, so these are commands uh, that tell you how to achieve a particular aim. For example, if you want to be paid well, then you need to um, you know, get a good education and work hard. Uh, but these are hypotheticals. You know, it's do this if you want that end goal. Now, according to Kant, the moral law is going to be a categorical imperative. Um, it is not a hypothetical imperative. So this is going to tell us that the moral law is not going to depend on the outcomes. It doesn't depend on, um, you know, what it is uh, achieved. 
Okay, so Kant thought that there was only one moral rule, one moral universal principle, um, that any one person could derive uh, through rational reflection. So, uh, although there was only one moral universal rule, Kant thought that there were a few different ways that it could be formulated. So, the first uh, well-known way of formulating the universal rule is known as uh, the formulation of the universal law. So act only on the maxims through which you can at the same time will it should become a universal law. Okay, so we need to break that down again. So maxims, uh, a maxim is a rule that connects an action to the reasons for acting. So again, this could be like a motivation or a goal or maybe even context for the situation of what's going on. Okay, so then for you to formulate a maxim, uh, you must name the action and give it reasons. Uh, for example, suppose that you're lying to a friend for financial gain. Um, you are in effect acting according to the maxim, uh, it's okay for you to lie to someone if it financially benefits you. Okay, so now with that understanding of maxims and that, uh, let's go back to the formulation of the universal law. So act only on the maxim through which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. Now to use this uh, rule to find out if an action is right, um, if you can consistently will that others do the same thing, then it is permissible. Um, if you cannot consistently will that others do the same thing, then it is going to be prohibited. Okay, so uh, the highlights, uh, this is going to highlight uh, this rule here, the, the universal rule, the, the categorical imperative here, um, is going to highlight two specific features of a moral rule um, that, you know, common sense and Kant are going to tell us that the moral rule should have, right? Like universality and impartiality. Okay, so uh, to give us an example here of how this is applying, um, Kant gives us the example of the uh, lying or the false promise. Um, uh, to see how we can apply uh, the formulation of the universal law uh, to specific situations. So suppose that you're borrowing money from a friend um, and you know you're not going to be able to give it back. Um, to get the loan in the first place, you decide to tell a lie, uh, falsely promising that you will re repay the money. Um, so to find out if such a uh, lying promise is permissible, Kant would have you ask, um, can you consistently will that such a maxim of your action become a universal law. In other words, um, can you, um, uh, what would happen if everyone else were to do the same thing? Okay, so let's think about the maxim here. Uh, whenever you need to borrow money that you can't repay it, uh, just uh, lie about it. Uh, lie and say that you promise you will repay it. Um, so what would happen if everyone who needed a loan, uh, you know, acted according to this maxim? Well, uh, you know, the people who needed loans would start lying to obtain them, uh, but then everyone would also know that, um, you know, they would be lying to obtain the loans, and so such a promise would be worthless. Um, so the custom of loaning money in the first place would just generally disappear and go away. Uh, so willing the maxim uh, to be a universal law uh, involves a contradiction, uh, in this case in particular, right? Uh, so if everyone makes a lying promise, then uh, promise making itself becomes no more. Uh, so this means, this is the consistency part, right? So this means that you cannot consistently will that everyone else act the same way. Um, therefore, it's a clear duty that making a lying promise to borrow money uh, is morally wrong. You have a duty not to be doing that. Okay, so Kant's formulation of the universal uh, law also has some other notable things to uh, say about bioethics. Um, so he also famously says, uh, you know, that there is an absolute prohibition against killing innocent people, um, against lying, against committing suicide, and uh, failing to help others when feasible. So the other, uh, there's a few other ways, but one of the other more well-known ways of formulating the categorical imperative is known as the formulation of humanity. So this tells us to act in such a way that you always treat humanity whether in your own person or in the persons of any other, never simply as a means, but always at the same time as an end. So the idea here behind the formulation of humanity is that people are the source of the moral law. They are the source of value. Um, and so all people should be treated as if they have uh, inherent moral worth and they should be treated with dignity and respect. 
So according to Kant, uh, a person's inherent worth comes from their autonomy. Um, this means that uh, it comes from their nature as a free, rational uh, being capable of directing their own lives, determining their own ends, um, and discerning their own rules in which to live by. So uh, notably, he's leaving out things like social status, wealth, talent, race, uh, or cultural to determine a person's wealth. Um, moreover, uh, all the people equally possess the same inherent value, according to Kant. And so all people derive the, um, or deserve the same level of dignity and respect. So treating someone with dignity and respect means uh, not treating them merely as a means to an end. For Kant, if we uh, thwart a person's freedom, uh, uh, freely choosing actions by coercing them, or undermining their rational decision making uh, by lying to them, or uh, discounting their equality by discriminating against them, um, then we're not respecting them as a person. These are instances where we're treating them as a means to an end. A mere means to an end. Okay, so clear-cut cases in bioethics uh, normally um, include uh, experimenting on people without their knowledge and consent, uh, lying to patients about their medical conditions or their prognosis, uh, forcing a patient to receive a treatment against their will. Um, so those are going to be instances of uh, violating someone's autonomy um, and disrespecting them, um, uh, treating them as a mere means to an end. So notice that the formulation uh, forbids us from treating someone as a mere means to an end. Um, obviously, in our everyday life, we're going to you know, engage with other people, um, and in so doing, we're going to treat them as means to an end. Um, you know, for instance, uh, we you know, use the cashier as a means to get our groceries, or the librarian as a means to get our books. Um, since these actions were freely chosen by these people, uh, the interactions with them um, were not actually you know, undermining their status as a person. Um, so it's uh, you know, morally wrong to treat someone as an instrument towards your ends, but uh, if they're engaging with you uh, freely and of their own volition, then um, you know, you're not uh, using them as a means to an end. So in biomedical research, uh, using human subjects as a mere means to an end, uh, uh, but not merely as a means to an end, if the subjects give their informed consent to participate in the research. So the last two theories we've gone over have been based on the idea of one single absolute moral principle or standard without exceptions. So for utilitarianism, it was that utility is the only measure of morality. For Kantian ethics, the rightness or wrongness of an action was determined by the categorical imperative. However, uh, some have argued that these theories uh, are simple and fail to capture um, a more full understanding of our moral experience. Uh, besides the moral principles of autonomy and utility, uh, our moral experience reveals that there are at least the other principles that we mentioned in the first lecture, non-malfeasance, beneficence, and justice. So, the uh, principalists here are, are going to argue that there has to be more than one simple rule or one single moral duty. But, you know, as we have been talking about, if we follow more than one absolute principle, um, then we're going to inevitably run into the problem of, you know, these two principles conflicting. Um, when honoring uh, one rule is going to uh, in entail violating the, uh, um, the other rule. So let's just, you know, take for instance, uh, you know, plausibly these two absolute principles. And um, let's say these are our only two principles in our moral theory. Do not lie and do not uh, harm patients. Well, even still, you're going to run into trouble. So uh, let's suppose that telling a mentally unstable patient the truth about uh, her terminal cancer will cause her immense psychological harm and probably hasten her death. So in this case, if the doctor tells the truth, it will cause her harm. If the doctor lies and only gives her good news, then it, um, she will not be harmed. So in this case, the doctor cannot both um, you know, tell the truth and avoid harm. Hence, having more than one absolute principle is going to inevitably lead to problems. All right, so like we talked about in the last uh, lecture, um, you know, the way around this uh, is when a theory has more than one principle is to say that some or all of the principles are going to be prima facie principles. So this means that the principles are going to generally apply, uh, but when the principles are going to come into conflict, uh, we're going to need to decide which principle is going to carry more weight in that situation. So principles would uh, represent our apparent duties. 
And when we reflect, uh, we are going to discover which of those principles is going to carry some more weight. Uh, and then that's how we're going to learn what our actual duty is going to be in that situation. Um, so this way of thinking about moral principles seems to fit well with our moral experience. Uh, for instance, uh, we know that sometimes our duties are going to conflict, that some of our duties are going to be more monumentous than others, um, and occasionally doing the right thing means violating a principle. Um, that even after breaking or overriding the rules, uh, they still seem essential to our moral experience. Okay, so this approach was, uh, of prima facie principles, was first articulated uh, by W.D. Uh, Ross in the 1930s. So he advocated for the following seven principles, uh, telling the truth, keeping promises, distributing benefits and burdens fairly, um, benefiting others, refraining uh, from harming others, making amends and causing injuries, or making amends for causing injuries, uh, and repaying services done. So in uh, bioethics, uh, Tom Bocamp and uh, James Childress uh, have developed the, the influential moral principles that are commonly used in bioethics today. Um, so this came from their work, Principles of Bioethics, in 1979. Um, so they advocated for four prima facie principles. Um, you should probably recognize these ones. Respect for autonomy, promote happiness, refrain from harming others, and distribute benefits and burdens uh, fairly. So that's going to be autonomy, beneficence, non-malfeasance, and justice right there. Um, as you can see throughout the class, uh, bioethics is going to be ripe with situations where these principles are going to come into conflict. So here are a couple, you know, quick situations that, uh, you know, are, are going to be common um, where the principles are going to come into conflict. So physicians discover that uh, his patient has a malignant breast tumor, uh, but because she is uh, terrified of cancer, he tells her that the tumor is benign and should be uh, surgically removed anyway. Um, suppose a 10-year-old boy is seriously injured when he is hit by a speeding car, and the only way to save him is to give him a blood transfusion, a procedure that his Jehovah's Witness parents reject. But the physician doing the transfusion, uh, or does the transfusion anyway to save the Jehovah's Witness boy's life, um, and is promptly sued by the parents. So another case uh, of, you know, the principles coming into conflict is a hopelessly ill patient um, in unrelenting agony, requesting help to be put out of their misery. Um, and removing the life-sustaining uh, treatment is only actually going to prolong their um, agony. Uh, so the physician, who has spent her entire career up to that point um, focused on saving lives, is now uh, forced to consider mercy killing as uh, an option for her suffering patient. Okay, so the main criticism here of principalism is that there's no stable way to determine which principle is going to be stronger. Um, so sometimes it's going to be autonomy, other times it's going to be utility, and sometimes it might not be clear which principle was supposed to override the other one. So the advice is to examine uh, the facts of the case and to make a considerable moral judgment and use the principles uh, as general moral guides. Uh, still, principles maintain that the weighing process is rational, generally reliable, and uh, not excessively subjective. Um, but, you know, that's up for you to decide. So, some have thought that the moral law is revealed to us through nature. Uh, this basic notion has been developed into what's called natural law theory. Uh, according to this approach, a right actions are those that are going to conform to moral standards uh, discerned in nature through human reasoning. So one of the underlying beliefs uh, behind this uh, theory is that nature, including humans, is somehow directed towards a particular end. This is also known, you know, you can think of this as nature is teleological. So further, humans achieve uh, this end when they follow their natural inclinations in accordance with nature's ends. Uh, so the natural processes and functions uh, are supposed to be in accordance with the natural law. And the natural way things are is supposed to be the way that they are supposed to be. The way they are is the way they're supposed to be. Uh, the moral takeaway is that humans act uh, towards these natural uh, ends. So, uh, one of the implicit assumptions is that humans are rational beings with the power to receive uh, the, work, uh, the workings of nature, uh, correctly discern the inclinations of humans, and recognize uh, the moral permissibility of our actions. 
So natural law has at its roots both uh, theistic and non-theistic thinkers, uh, but the dominant version of this theory was first formulated by theological philosopher uh, Thomas Aquinas. So uh, not only is this the uh, official moral outlook of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, but this is also an intellectual starting point for many contemporary versions of this theory, or uh, both secular and otherwise. Uh, so for Aquinas, God is the author of uh, all of nature, and God gave his gift of reason, um, which gives us the ability for us to discern the natural law uh, for ourselves according to our lives. So Aquinas claims that uh, human beings naturally uh, tend towards and therefore have a duty towards, uh, one, uh, preserving human life and health, um, and so also not killing the innocent, uh, two, producing and raising children, uh, three, keeping, uh, seeking knowledge, including knowledge of God, uh, four, uh, cultivating cooperative and social relationships. So the overarching aim of natural law theory uh, approach to ethics is to do good and avoid evil. So natural law uh, does not offer us a lot of like clear guidance in every situation, uh, but it does give us some general moral principles that uh, can be useful in ethical situations. Uh, some of the general ethical principles uh, are uh, supposed to apply absolutely. For instance, according to natural law theory, it's absolutely prohibited uh, to directly kill the innocent, uh, lying, or using contraceptives. Uh, Aquinas himself uh, also included adultery, blasphemy, and sodomy as actions that were just considered wrong in themselves. Um, like I talked about in uh, the previous segment, when we have more than one absolute principle, um, these principles are going to run into conflict. Um, in the last segment, principalism resolved this conflict by uh, stating that principles are prima facie. Uh, when duties conflict, the, you know, one, we must decide which one's going to override the other. Um, however, since natural law posits that uh, all of these are absolute duties, uh, this is not going to be an option for them. Um, instead, natural law relies on the doctrine of double effect. Um, so the doctrine of double effect was first introduced by Aquinas um, and really has been a cornerstone of Roman Catholic uh, ethics ever since. Okay, so we can think about this in terms of like two actions. So we have action one and action two. Uh, performing action one uh, is a bad action to bring about a good effect is never morally permissible. Now in action two, Performing a good action may sometimes be acceptable, even if it is known to produce some bad effects. So more precisely, the principle uh, says that it's always wrong to intentionally perform a bad action to produce a good effect, but doing a good action that results in bad effects may be permissible if the bad effects are not intended, even though they may be foreseen. Okay, so uh, in the former case, uh, a bad thing, uh, it's said to be a bad thing to directly uh, in cause the harm and intend it. In uh, the latter case, the bad thing is that uh, it's not bad because it's not directly intended. All right, so natural law is going to offer us four tests to determine whether an action is morally permissible or not. It's only going to take failing one of these tests for an action to be deemed not morally permissible. So test one, the action itself is morally permissible. Test two, causing a bad effect must not be used to obtain a good effect. The ends must not justify the means. Test three, whatever the outcome of an action, the intention must be to cause only the good effect. The bad effect can be foreseen, but never intended. Test four, the bad effect of an action must not be greater in importance than the good effect. All right, so now let's try and apply these tests to a couple of cases. So let's suppose that an 80-year-old hopelessly ill patient in continuous unbearable pain begs to be put out of her misery. Is it morally permissible for, uh, to grant her request, either giving her lethal injection or by removing all life-sustaining measures? So according to the doctrine of double effect just outlined, the answer seems to be no. Both active and passive euthanasia forms uh, are not going to be morally acceptable. Uh, still, many agree that it is permissible uh, not to treat a hopelessly ill person um, who ordinarily life-sustaining treatments are useless. 
So it is permissible to not treat someone when uh, the life-sustaining treatment is going to be useless. Um, in, so again, yeah, it just takes uh, failing one of these tests to uh, be considered not morally permissible. So let's see exactly how uh, you know, this, this, uh, these tests could be applied to this situation. Test one, taking steps to terminate someone's life is a clear violation of test one. Whatever is, uh, affects the action of taking a life is in itself immoral, a violation of the cardinal duty to preserve innocent life. Test two, ending the woman's life to save her from terrible suffering is an instance of causing a bad effect, the woman's death, as a means to achieve a good effect, the cessation of pain. And so it fails test two. Test three, the death of the woman is intended. It is not merely a tragic side effect of an attempt to solely ease the, her pain. And so it's going to fail test three. Test four, causing the death of an innocent person is a great evil that cannot be counterbalanced by the good of pain relief. And so it's going to fail test four. Now intentions are gonna matter a lot here. If the patient's death was not intentionally caused but unintentionally brought about, uh, then it might be morally permissible. Suppose the physician uh, seeing the woman in agonizing pain gives her a large injection of morphine, uh, realizing, uh, minimizing to minimize her suffering, knowing full well that this dose is probably going to speed her death. So in this case, we'll supply the same for uh, test. According to test one, the act of easing the woman's pain is itself morally permissible, so it passes test one. According to test two, her death is not a means to achieve some greater good. The goal is to uh, ease her suffering, so it passes test two. Uh, now according to test three, her death is not intended. The intention was to alleviate her pain, though the unintended but foreseen side effect is uh, her hastened death, so it passes test three. And finally, test four, the good effect of an easier death seems more or less equivalent uh, in importance to the bad effect of hastening someone's death. So it passes test four. So therefore, uh, unintentionally, but knowingly bringing about uh, the woman's death is morally permissible in this case. Uh, the doctrine of double effect also seems to allow a nuanced application to some cases of abortion. In the traditional cases of abortion, uh, it's seen as in the intentionally destruction, uh, the intentional destruction of an innocent human life, um, and so it is, uh, you know, called uh, directly wrong. Uh, the abortion is always con it itself is considered immoral, um, so it would fail test one. Uh, again, on the traditional tests, uh, it is wrong even um, if it is to perform uh, some good result. Uh, such as saving the mother's life or preventing serious harm to her. So, uh, you know, it's gonna, the traditional reasons for abortion are gonna fail tests two and three. Uh, still, actions leading uh, unintentionally to her death of the fetus, so called uh, an un indirect abortion, uh, may be permissible, but that's gonna be in rare cases. Uh, but still, again, all it has to do is, uh, the traditional case of abortion would just have to do is fail one of those uh, to be considered uh, immoral. Uh, but as I said, there, there's like a nuanced possibility of understanding this. Uh, so let's suppose, for instance, uh, that a pregnant woman uh, has an infectious disease uh, that kills her unless she gets an infection from a powerful drug. But that drug uh, will also cause the abortion of the fetus. So according to the doctrine of double effect, let's go back to our four tests. Receiving the injection may be morally permissible if the action itself is morally permissible. Um, so it seems to pass uh, test one. Uh, getting the uh, injection of the drug itself seems morally permissible. If the death of the fetus is not used to rescue the woman, it seems that it would pass test two. If the injections are given with the intended uh, intention of curing the woman's disease and not of inducing the abortion, then it would pass test three. And according to test four, if the death of the fetus is balanced by the life of the woman, then it would also pass test four. John Rawls is one of the most influential advocates of contractarianism. Contractarianism generally refers to moral theories based on the idea of some sort of social contract or an agreement amongst individuals for their mutual advantage. So Rawls uses the notion of a social contract to generate and defend moral principles governing how uh, members of society should treat one another. 
he uses a thought experiment. Um, so he supposes that people are coming together to form a society um, and they want to ensure the most fair and equal distribution of rights, duties, and benefits of social cooperation. Um, Rawls proposes that if the initial conditions are actually fair and unbiased, then they would create a just society on just principles, uh, which uh, we should then use those principles in our society. Um, so as Rawls says, uh, the guiding idea is that the principle of justice for the basic structure of society are the objects of the original agreement. They are the principles that free and rational persons concerned to further their own interests would accept on an initial position of equality as defining the fundamental terms of their association. The principles are to regulate all further agreements. They specify the kinds of social cooperations that can be entered into and the forms of government that can be established. So this is supposed to be a hypothetical starting point for Rawls and it's called the original position. Um, we have a group of normal, self-interested, rational individuals who come together to choose principles that will determine um, you know, how to distribute society's benefits and burdens. Um, in, in thinking about society's benefits and burdens, you can think about it in more tangible terms of distributing tax benefits um, and then the benefits of you know, social welfare programs, things like that. Okay, so uh, now it gets really hypothetical. So these totally normal, uh, self-interested, rational individuals are supposed to be behind what's called a metaphorical veil of ignorance. Um, so behind this veil of ignorance, the people are not supposed to know uh, their own social or economic status, uh, their own class, race, sex, abilities, talents, levels of intelligence, or psychological makeup. In other words, they're supposed to be completely unencumbered by uh, any kind of bias, and they are all supposed to be equally rational thinkers um, who think about these principles as guiding society um, that they're all going to be living in. So from that original position, Rawls argues that uh, given the principles are, uh, or no, yeah, Rawls argues that uh, given uh, the participants are rational and uh, self-interested, but ignorant of their own a position in that society that they are going to uh, not agree to principles um, uh, that are going to advantage one particular group or another, uh, but rather they are going to agree uh, that uh, to principles that are going to be advantageous for everyone involved. And the main reason for that is because they don't know which position they're going to be in society. So they don't want to say, oh, we're going to give this group all the benefits and this group no benefits, but you know, give them all the labor because they don't know whether which group they're going to be in when they, when they come out from behind this veil of ignorance. So that's where it becomes pretty hypothetical there. Okay, so uh, basically Rawls thought that uh, you know, they would choose these principles. Uh, the principles they would choose are going to be unbiased and non-discriminatory. Um, again, the idea is that on the assumption that the original position is fair, then the participants would produce uh, just principles. So Rawls thinks uh, the original position would produce the following principles. The greatest equal liberty principle. Each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive total system of equal basic liberties compatible with a, a similar system of liberty for all. The difference principle. Society and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both A, to the benefit of the least advantaged, and B, attached to offices and positions that are open to all under conditions of fair equality of opportunity. Alright, so the first principle is also known as uh, the equal liberty principle. Uh, the idea is that everyone is entitled to the most freedom possible exercised through the basic rights and duties. Uh, but no one is entitled to have more than anyone else. Okay, so Rawls thought that everyone should have a right to vote, a uh, right to hold office, everyone should also have uh, freedom of speech, assembly, and thought. Um, so the principles uh, should take precedence over um, all other considerations. Uh, individual liberties cannot be uh, reduced or canceled just because uh, to you know, improve some uh, social or economic well-being. Okay, so the second principle is about the distribution of society's economics uh, goods uh, such as income, 
uh, wealth, uh, opportunities, and uh, positions of authority. Uh, so the second part the, of this principle, so there are two principles and the second principle has two parts. So the second part of the second principle uh, says that everyone should have equal chance to acquire the basic goods. Pretty straightforward. Uh, to be clear, this is not some socialist principle uh, that says everyone is guaranteed equal access to the jobs um, or something like that. Um, it's more uh, a matter of equal access to the jobs. It's not a matter of everyone gets a job but equal access to them. Uh, so rather, uh, the second principle is merely uh, is saying that the benefits should be open to all, regardless of their social standing. Yeah. So uh, Rawls would admit that social and economic inequalities uh, are going to naturally arise, uh, but these inequalities uh, are not unjust as long as they are, um, you know, to the advantage of the least well-off. Uh, the least well-off uh, also just means uh, the person, the lowest person in society. Um, so that's going to be the second part of the second, uh, the second principle there. Uh, do, according to Rawls, uh, the first principle must be satisfied first, uh, then the second part of the second principle, uh, and then the first part of the second principle. Um, okay, so the idea is that according to uh, a just distribution of benefits and burdens, uh, the first priority is to ensure equal access to liberties uh, for everyone concerned. Uh, and then the next priority is uh, equality of opportunity. And then the next priority is uh, when there are inequalities, uh, that these inequalities uh, should be given to uh, the advantage of the least well off. Um, so, okay, so Rawls' theory is going to be really important when we talk about uh, healthcare. Um, uh, here's one example of a prominent line of argumentation that uses Rawls' theory. Uh, as Rawls claims, everyone is entitled to fair equality of opportunity and adequate basic health care uh, enables fair equality of opportunity by ensuring normal species functioning. Therefore, everyone is entitled to adequate health care, which includes all appropriate measures for eliminating or compensating for disadvantages or diseases and impairments. It seems that uh, according to Rawls' theory of justice, um, everyone should have access to the basic levels of health care. Um, but other elective services uh, would, all, would be available, but they would mainly just be available for those who could afford them. So as I said at the top, there are two main approaches to ethical theories. There are the theories of right action, and there are virtue-based theories. So unlike the previous theories, which were concerned with principles about doing the right things, uh, virtue-based theories are centered around developing virtuous characteristics. So according to this theory, Having a good character is the key to living a moral life. The truly virtuous person will naturally choose the right actions when it arises. So virtues are our ingrained dispositions to act according to ethical standards. And when a person has a good ingrained standard, then when they act, they're going to act, uh, they're going to try and meet those high standards. So a right action, according to virtue ethics, is not determined by some rule, but rather by asking what would a virtuous person do? Um, or another way of thinking about it is this action in accordance with virtue. So Aristotle um, was the primary source of virtue ethics. Um, it was a contemporary, or contemporary for him, germ, uh, Greek uh, ethical approach, uh, but he's one of the more prominent uh, thinkers that we uh, you know, get from today. So Aristotle thought that the best human life was one full of human flourishing, or in the ancient Greek, eudaimonia, which is sometimes translated as happiness. Um, and the best way to live uh, a life is to develop uh, virtues. So virtues not only help us make good choices, uh, but they also just generally help us live good lives. So virtue ethics is not just simply asking us to uh, follow some moral rule, rather it's directing us um, that we should aspire to live uh, morally exceptional lives. Um, in this sense, uh, virtue ethics is not going to be goal, or is going to be goal-directed, and rather uh, than being uh, rule or action guiding. So the idea is that uh, virtues such as uh, benevolence, honesty, loyalty, uh, compassion, uh, fairness, and so on, um, are the ideals that we should be you know, striving towards. So according to uh, virtue ethics, uh, character is something um, that we can change over time. Uh, we can become a more virtuous person by reflecting on our lives and practicing uh, virtuous behavior. 
Um, one way of doing this is by imitating moral exemplars, such as Gandhi, Buddha, Jesus, Mohammed, um, or Socrates. So furthermore, according to uh, virtue ethics, doing the right thing, um, we must also be doing it with like, the appropriate motives. Uh, so for example, if we were to see a friend drowning, um, and we were to you know, go in and save them, um, you know, out of our genuine feelings for compassion, kindness, loyalty, or companionship, um, rather than out of some like uh, you know obedience to uh, you know the moral rule or exception, like that would be fine for uh, th those are fine motives according to uh, virtue ethics for saving someone. Now, in contrast, Kant is going to say that doing the right thing, we should only be motivated by our sense of duty. Now, virtue ethicists think that that is a very bleak uh, like approach to morality. Um, and they think that the motives uh, are relevant for evaluating a person's moral character. They tend to think that saving the friend uh, merely out of a sense of duty um, and saying that you didn't really care whether they lived or died seems like uh, the friend really, you know, would be a little thrown off by that. Um, so in light of this, many people tend to try and incorporate virtues into their theories of moral obligation. So in terms of bioethics, physicians, nurses uh, are expected to uh, possess certain virtues, such as uh, compassion, trustworthiness, um, justice, and honesty. So medical professionals um, are not just expected to know the technical skills, uh, but rather they are expected to do right by their patients. Um, and one of the ways to do that is through by developing the virtues. Um, a virtue ethics approach to bioethics would be to judge the motivations of the actions. Okay, so for example, if a woman is deciding to have an abortion because she's afraid of the responsibilities of parenthood, um, then they, a uh, virtue ethicist, might judge that she is, uh, you know, being a coward or showing some sort of cowardice there. Um, if she wants to go through with the abortion merely because the pregnancy would disrupt her vacation plans, um, she shows a certain sense of uh, you know, self-centeredness or callousness. This is, it's more like revealing her character, um, you know, in, in this instance. Um, okay, so according to virtue ethics, in both cases it seems unlikely that, uh, you know, the woman's decision in these cases would be considered virtuous. Generally, moral theorizing emphasizes abstract principles, general duties, individual rights, impartial judgments, and deliberative reasoning. But feminist scholars have pointed out that ethics is not always impartial and disinterested. Rather, a lot of ethical situations often center around close personal relationships and the approach of ethics, uh, the care of ethics, um, can, argues that we should consider values such as empathy, compassion, love, sympathy, and fidelity in our moral reasoning. So this approach to ethics was first highlighted by psychologist Carol Gil Gilligan. Gilligan in her 1982 book, uh, In a Different Voice. Uh, the idea is that men and women have different approaches to moral reasoning. Men typically appeal to principles of uh, duty and rights, while women typically focus on uh, personal relationships, care, and empathy. So Gilligan thought uh, that men were guided by an ethics of uh, justice and rights, while women were guided by an ethics of care and compassion. Uh, she thought that both types of uh, ca uh, caring should be uh, brought into, uh, or should have their both uh, have their own place in our ethical practices. So, since her research in the 80s, uh, it's a lot more research is coming out to show that moral reasoning doesn't really break break down along these gender lines. Um, but still, it's a very influential theory that helps put uh, caring at the central of morality. Um, so virtue ethics seems to support this idea, and it seems like compassion, empathy, and kindness are all virtues uh, that should be elements of our moral lives. So furthermore, many have argued that the principle of impartiality is probably taken a little bit too far in you know, modern ethics. Uh, because the principle of impartiality requires us to consider everyone's, uh, everyone equally and, and count everyone's interests equally the same as well. Um, it seems like this uh, is a good principle for applying, t uh, you know, justice to a large group, uh, but it seems impractical uh, when applying to uh, relationships with family, friends, and other loved ones. Um, we seem to have special obligations to these people that we don't have to humanity as a whole. 
The care perspective is essentially meaningful for roles such as parent, friend, physician, and nurse, in which contextual response, attentive to subtle, attentiveness to subtle cues, and deepening special relationships are likely to be more important morally than impartial treatment. May I devote my time and resources to caring for my own friends and family, even if it means ignoring the needs of other people who I could help. From an impartial point of view, our duty is to promote the interests of everyone alike. But few of us accept that view. The ethics of care confirms the priority that we naturally give to our family and friends, and it seems more plausible moral conception. So the ethics of care allows us to take emotions and uh, reactions into account. Many of the other ethical theories that we've been looking at uh, traditionally downplay the roles of emotions and attitudes and motivations um, and just emphasize duties. Again, for example, Kant thinks that the right thing um, is only done for rightness sake. But uh, some think that raising kids for duty's sake alone is just an empty practice. Rather, being a good parent seems to involve loving, caring attitudes and emotions towards your children. Many think that a full ethical view should account for the ethics of obligation um, and the ethics of care. As Annette Baer said, it is clear, I think, that the best moral theory has to be cooperative product of men and women, has to harmonize justice and care. The morality it theorizes about is, after all, for all persons, for men and for women, and will need their combined insights. As Jilligan said, what we need now is a marriage of the old male and the newly articulated female insights. The ethics of care seems to particularly resonate with nurses. Caring is very much an essential part of their job. All right, so now when we think about applying the ethical, uh, traditional theories versus the ethics of care, uh, when we apply the traditional theories of ethics uh, to bioethical cases, um, everyone involved should be attending to the relevant moral principles, uh, striving for an impartial stance, emphasizing individual rights, and engaging in impassive moral deliberation. Now, in contrast, uh, the ethics of care is going to insist that medical care providers uh, pay more attention to specific needs of patients and their families, uh, be aware of the specific relations they have with each other, and understand the attitudes and feelings at work among them, um, and act with compassion and sympathy and respect. Feminist ethics is an approach to ethics that attempts to call out misogyny in traditional theories of ethics, specifically along the following four assumptions. Women's moral concerns are not as important as men's. Women are morally inferior to men, less mature or less rational. The moral issues that arise from domestic or private life, the area traditionally relegated exclusively to women, are inconsequential. And the concepts of virtue traditionally associated with, with women in Western cultures, community, nature, interconnectedness, caring, feeling, sharing, and others, are not central to morality. So unlike the other ethical theories uh, we've been looking at, feminist ethics is not going to be unified by some ideology or set of doctrines. Uh, rather, feminist ethics is defined by a focus on these uh, traditional or these issues in traditional ethics. So as you might expect, feminist ethics uh, generally downplays the roles of moral principles uh, as, that they play in our moral reasoning. Instead, they tend to suggest uh, that we take into account uh, the more practical realities of the situation, uh, the relevant social practices, uh, relationships, institutions, uh, and current power arrangements. Uh, traditional principles like autonomy, utility, freedom, equality um, are too abstract and uh, to actually be useful to people enmeshed in real concrete social situations. So respecting women's autonomy for an abortion for whatever reason is nice and all, but it's kind of meaningless if the society is set up in such a way that thoroughly undermines her autonomy. So further, feminist uh, ethics tend to reject the traditional concepts of a moral agent. As Jan Crossweight said, the old notion is that of abstract individuals as fundamentally autonomous agents, 
aware of their own preferences and values, and motivated by rational self-interests, though not necessarily selfish. But, she says, many feminists present a richer conception of the person as historically and culturally located, socially related, and essentially embodied. Individuals are located in and formed by specific relationships, chosen and unchosen, and ties of affection and responsibility. Such a conception of socially embedded selves refocuses thinking about autonomy, shifting the emphasis from independent self-determination towards ideals of integrity within relatedness. Respecting autonomy becomes less a matter of protecting individuals from coercive influences than one of positive empowerment, recognizing people's interdependence and supporting individuals' development of their own understanding of their situation and options. Although feminists generally support liberation and equality for women, they tend to disagree on exactly how to apply these values to specific bioethical situations. Most, but not all, are going to support unimpeded access for abortions. And if you want to look into it, they have a lot of divergent views on surrogacy and other reproductive technologies like IVF. Casuistry is another approach to moral reasoning that doesn't appeal to any principles. Uh, but rather, this approach appeals to analogous reasoning um, to make moral judgments. According to this approach, when we come across a new ethical problem, um, you should compare it to uh, the, previous, or the case at hand to previous cases. Um, like in uh, law, we would compare the current case to uh, case precedent, things like that. So the idea is, how is the new case similar to the previous cases? Uh, casuists are going to point out that moral reasoning arises, or the problems in moral reasoning arise when we are applying uh, principles too strictly without attending to the relevant moral details. They think that uh, reasonable moral judgments can be arrived at by carefully attending to the specific details of the cases and the circumstances at hand. So another favor, or another reason in favor of this approach is that we tend to be more confident about uh, specific moral judgments uh, than we are about uh, judgments based on moral, uh, general moral principles. So although uh, casualistry seems to have uh, these benefits, many moral philosophers have criticized the system. Uh, for one, uh, the system that uh, supposedly does not rely on any principles uh, is implicitly relying on principles. Casuists sometimes write as if paradigm cases speak for themselves or inform moral judgments by their facts alone, an implausible thesis. For the casuists to move constructively from case to case, a recognized and morally relevant norm must connect the cases. The norm is not part of the fact or the narrative of the case involved. It is a way of interpreting, evaluating, and linking the cases. All analogous reasoning in casuistry, casuistry requires a connecting norm to indicate that one sequence of events is morally like or unlike another sequence of relevant aspects. Critics also question casuistry as a way of justifying moral decisions um, or selecting uh, the selection of paradigm cases. Casuists maintain that the justification comes from society's traditions, values, or conventions. But it seems obvious that something would uh, be necessary to counteract uh, biases, arbitrariness, or vagueness of these influences. In the end, casuistry has made valuable contributions to our understanding of uh, moral reasoning, uh, but in its purest form, uh, casuistry is going to be problematic. Uh, recently, some have attempted to demonstrate uh, ways that casuistry um, you know, can take into account other moral principles and is not going to have necessarily all these problems. All right, so that's all of the moral theories uh, that we're going to be covering in this class. And um, yeah, just make sure you guys are aware of these theories. Uh, these are going to produce the principles and the basis, the rational basis for the principles that we're going to be using um, and applying to cases in this bioethics class. So see you there.